Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Nazar Bina, and this is Omni Channel X's Omni Channel Podcast. Omni Channel X is brought to you by Urbina Consulting. Omni Channel X is our international learning portal where we host the thought leaders and case studies we think will be most helpful for content rich organizations trying to build better relationships across all touch points. Now, enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am super excited about this episode. I am here today with Jeff Eaton. He's a partner at Autogram and all around one of my favorite folks in this industry. Um, Jeff and I are uh, renowned for uh, going off on one when we when we get going. So this is going to be an exciting conversation, uh, I'm sure. So uh, let's start, Jeff. Uh, I, I'm sure that most of my followers, uh, if not all, have probably heard of you or know of you. But can you please uh, introduce yourself, describe a bit of your background um, and uh, what kind of work you do? Yeah. Um, so my name is Jeff Eaton. I'm a partner at Autogram, uh, sort of a bespoke um, consultancy. We do, um, you know, content modeling, information architecture, design system work, um, basically all the stuff that's necessary when like a large to mid-sized org says, hmm, we should launch a new initiative and it needs stuff, or we're going to migrate, or we've acquired a company and they have all this web stuff and we have all our web stuff, ah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my background is, um, let's say back, uh, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and we were all very excited that Netscape had just added tables. Um, <laughs> I dove in and I, you know, I started, I, I was a freelance writer and designer at the time, um, doing, you know, like, I, I like wrote for you know, tech magazines and stuff like that. Um, but I ended up starting to build out web stuff because it was interesting. It was cool. You could publish your own thing. Um, and very shortly, I ended up becoming the guy at the agency I worked for who did the web stuff. Um, but then, you know, that was pretty early, but, you know, over the years as I got deeper and deeper into that, um, you know, I started, I really dove into the, the backend side of things, you know, building out sites, managing servers. Um, and over the course of that, um, I ended up becoming one of the contributors, you know, one of the core contributors to the Drupal project and ended up working in that space for probably about, uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, both, um, just, you know, building meat and potatoes, you know, CMS software, um, but then also increasingly working on planning and architecting um, really large scale migrations where hmm. companies were saying, oh, let's, you know, build a white label Drupal based, you know, platform for us to spin up, you know, websites for, you know, our properties and stuff like that. Um, I ended up working with uh, Lullabot, one of the premier Drupal agencies uh, in that space and um, built out their uh, con digital strategy and content strategy practice um, over the course of probably like eight to 10 years or so. Uh, yeah, I, for me, you were kind of synonymous with Lullabot for ages. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's uh, now uh, all of us practice is headed by uh, Greg Dunlap, who, you know, we were, uh, we were, you know, co we were, I guess, the the co nerds of uh, content strategy at Lullabot for many years. Um, and he's got a he's got a great team going on there. Um, but um, like probably maybe about like five, you know, five years or so ago, I really started chewing on a couple of specific challenges that I was seeing with a lot of our, a lot of our clients um, around the way that structured content models and design systems and um, CMS architectural choices, you know, beyond just the content, um, were all being like pursued and iterated on by like the technical teams, the design teams, the content teams, and good decisions were getting made, but like things just were not adding up once all the pieces had had to come together. And um, it, it felt like there was a real, in particular, there was a real um, collision between the good and like cutting edge work that was going on with component oriented design modules in mm -hmm. the design systems world and the increasing um, understanding of and use of like component oriented content and headless CMSs and stuff like that. Um, and I started talking to Karen McGrain and Ethan Marcotte, uh, Karen McGrain, the author of Content Strategy for Mobile, and you know, a long time, you know, IA guru in, you know, that world, and Ethan Marcotte, who, um, you know, wrote the book on responsive design, 
Um, and we started talking about like all of us were seeing the same kind of pattern from different mm -hmm. angles. And um, in particular around like the growing world of like high variation content where templated stuff is easy, totally one-off stuff. Everybody just knows, you know, you throw a designer and a developer and a content person at that and they make it happen. But this middle zone of like landing pages and customizable X and Y where companies say, yeah, but also we sort of want Squarespace built into our CMS. Mm. That zone was like this increasing explosion of problems as organizations tried to manage and, and you know, tackle it both from um, a governance standpoint and an ongoing maintenance standpoint and in places where the content model had to really dovetail effectively with the design system for that kind of approach to work. So um, when you say like we want Squarespace square built in, so this is we, we <laughs> want to have bits of uh, we want to have like islands of these quick, easy builder pages mixed with a more structured application, more structured. Background. Yeah, the idea is like, um, you know, editorially designed pages, essentially, where mm -hmm. what's there, what kinds of elements are on the page, what kind of stuff's going on there. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some dynamic stuff. Maybe there's some hard coded, you know, handwritten stuff copy just for this page. Maybe there's lists of things from elsewhere getting pulled in, but it's all being sort of conceptualized on the fly by the producer, by the page producer or the content creator or whatever role is responsible for it. And the idea is they want to have like a CMS style builder for that kind of stuff, not a conversation with the development team and a ticket and a request to add and some new six month wait. And stuff like that. Exactly. Um, and, you know, it's understandable, but we found that <laughs> inevitably you know once you get that kind of capability in there very quickly lots of the site ends up being built with that because you know everything looks like a nail once you've got that particular hammer so the and... ability to do a bit of unstructured people exactly don't and yeah. what's fascinating to me is that even you know good good page builder like that it's still built on structured content you know the individual chunks of stuff that they're putting together it's not like they're just throwing html at the screen like the bad old days but what actually is that page that they've created conceptually in well, your yeah, system well, you, what you're, you're, is you're really <laughs> you're really raising a big question of well, you, we use this word mm -hmm. structure um, yes. so structured, structured as is structured as opposed to a wall of blathering words. Um, there's, yes. and then there's structured uh, in the sense it's better chunked up, you know, they're using better use of lists yes. and, heads and tables, et cetera. But then there's structure isn't, we actually know what we're talking about here. Well, uh, it's interesting because choosing at, a, a purpose and an intention for these sections, giving them a name. And then and, other sections of a similar type will be consistent. And it's shared with other kinds of pages of the same style. Exactly. Yes. And what, what we found consistently is that, you know, once an organization got to, you know, hundreds, thousands, even of pages that were built out using these tools, they faced exactly the same organizational problem they did in the bad old days of raw HTML stuff yeah. thrown into a directory, which was. It's not really that different we don't know what's there. We can't rework the design because all of the elements they've used to build things are deeply baked into their connection with the output templates and the design system modules. And if we start iterating that, all these pages break and we aren't sure why. We aren't sure what those pages are trying to do with them because what that page is at a conceptual and meaningful level just exists in the mind of the person who threw those modules together. It so may be I want to pause but, there for a second. Yeah. So I think we're getting to the root of the difference between content that is, has been modeled mm -hmm. and, the, and the different uh, and content that is kind of been used a, a, more, a bit more of a chunky uh, or chunk oriented page builder and they are not the same thing. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm I'm very excited about this because I, I'm constantly, I, I came from- we, we call it the high variance content. You know, it's stuff that still needs to be structured, but there's a yeah. high degree of variance in what's being done with it and what form it's put in. That's a real problem. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So for me, that's a, a model that lends itself well to uh, adaptive or personalization. 
Mm-hmm. So the, um, and I'll, I'll, I think we should probably come back. That's to another that. space where the same challenge ends up coming up, even if it's not editorially designed pages, the yeah. idea that we're going to have to use rules and algorithms to assemble stuff runs into the same challenges very quickly. Yeah, exactly. And so for me, when I use the term structured, um, I, I'm always coming back to this separation of concerns mm-hmm. between uh, uh, layout and, and visual uh, experience and uh, the content itself, which is governed by more of a meaning, um, meaning, purpose, intent, uh, actual like meaningful labels, aka semantic tagging, um, and this is core right now. The the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the hot buzzword, one of our, one of the hot buzzwords in our in our industry right now is headless, which <laughs> supports our favorite uh, buzzword, <laughs> um, which, which we of course is not a buzzword here at Omnichannel X, which is Omnichannel. Mm-hmm. So if we're going to do these things, the separation of concerns is really important to have this um, content, which is structured enough that it is no longer locked into this page inc- incarnation and could be operated on by a program or by a filter or by something that could make it look different, could be migrated to a different uh, page, could be white labeled into a microsite, or even go to a completely different format like print, mm-hmm. PD, uh, print PDF. There may be work in the translation, but you have the capability of doing that in a regular struct in in a regular and consistent fashion. Without it all falling apart. So how how okay. Um I got all the questions. So (laughs) do you have uh let's kind of walk this through for people who who are are getting into this content modeling thing. Is you're on the content modeling uh excerpts panels that we're running this this year uh, as part of our content um modeling design series. Uh, so we're talking a lot about content modeling these days. So do you have, uh, can you walk us through a little bit of the approach? What methodologies or frameworks do you use? And, uh, and what do you do when you come into this kind of situation where they want to do all the things, but they want to move to this more manageable, more consistent, uh, shared kind of uh, content as a service model? Um, so, you know, not to go too far into the philosophical um, <clears throat> language has been one of our core metaphors for this, um, mm-hmm. because the idea is once you get to the point, as you, as you do in these high variation page buildery types of scenarios, where you have lots of different component elements and you want them to be assemblable in lots of different ways to communicate different kinds of meaning what you have isn't um, an assembly problem. What you have is a language kind of problem because ultimately you are trying to communicate messages. You know, that's what content is. It's, you know, it's a perspective, it's a message, it has an intended audience, it has a medium that it moves through, you know, you know, and that's that, you know, different channel conversion that you were talking about, you know, mm-hmm. a message can be converted to different medium. But in order to really effectively tackle these kinds of, you know, high variation problems, you have to start thinking in terms of like, what's our core like lexicon? What are the things that we are, kinds of things that we are trying to do as we communicate? What are the pieces that our messages get composed out of? In the same way that like um, an essay in rhetoric has meaningful distinct sections you know there's the introduction there's supporting statements there's a conclusion there's references and citations and stuff like that recipes have ingredients steps techniques all that stuff that we're familiar with Um, lots of different kinds of things have that kind of structure and when you start making things that can be assembled in those sorts of arbitrary ways you need to think about not just what's the list of things that we can stick in there. You also need to think about the grammar that is inherent in them. What things can start off a new piece of content? What things are only really meant to close? What things go together and support each other versus, you know, stand alone? How things are meant to connect to each other and work together to compose a complete meaningful message? That's a big part of it. Um, And, you know, from a 
work standpoint, that's not too different from the basic component inventory kind of work that you do when you're breaking things down, but thinking about it in those terms of what are these pieces? How are they meant to go together? What rules govern can you how give they a, connect? Can you give them like a concrete example? Like um, okay, to give um, the recipes example, but like something that- uh, Let's say, let's say a product. Is. Okay, let's say uh -huh. a product page or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Something like um, you could say, oh, we've, we've got um, case studies, we've got um, pull quotes, things like that. Those are very specific kinds of things, but you could say that they're all in a category of uh, social proof. There, other people have used this product and met with success. Other people have good things to say about this product, stuff like that. You might say that um, some sort of social proof element is a required element of a product page. It could mm -hmm. be lots of things. Um, and you can either open with a social proof or you can have a social proof in the middle. You don't close with a social proof. You always close with a directive or a next step or something Call like that. Action. Exactly, a call to action. Whatever you call it, whatever you yeah. name these things, the important part is starting to develop inside of the organization a vocabulary that actually makes sense to the different people working with it on the design side, on the you know engineering side, on the content production side, so that when we say, oh, we're making a product page, what you are saying is going to be there makes sense even if there's a high degree of variation in it there's an agreed upon rhythm to it and there's an understanding of what pieces are going to be a part of that and how they're meant to support each other like you can't create a product page without a call to action you can't create a product page that doesn't have some social proof you can't create a product page that doesn't have some of these things but it can grow it can stretch it can you know have different um, rhythms inside of it as long as it meets certain criteria and so that I essentially a, is like a promise if we say yeah. it's a product page it has these things maybe more variation than a than a typical strictly modeled structured you know templated page mm -hmm. but it still has some of the benefits of like software being able to interrogate it and say what's there this block isn't just a three up grid it's the social proof portion of this product page okay so uh that i could all right so that's that's is, is step one of coming and kind of inventorying and developing that common yeah. language of, of product so how uh, sorry I'm, I'm thinking of, of projects we're working on right yeah. now and, and something that i do a lot which is then how do you socialize that concept and the benefits of it to design teams and tech teams who really don't especially kind of care and haven't been used to caring so much that they're busy designing stuff up and they want to make a they want to make an app they want to make a page they want to make a thing they want to do a brochure um and you're coming in and kind of putting this uh, language requirement how do you uh get them excited about participating with this well, getting so getting folks excited about it, Exc and excited, make, and then yeah. actually excited doing is it. A, excited is a very lofty goal. Um, not angry is usually the first goal. <laughs> <clears throat> I I would actually say, and this is actually something that um, Ethan Marcotte often says about design systems, and what you know, Karen McGrain and I have often said about content models. Um, thinking about like this sort of organizational language for communication. Um, <laughs> your organization already has one. It may already have several. The question isn't, do you have this? It's how consistent is it? And is it a good fit? And is it working for you? And in that sense, treating it as we're trying to smooth this out. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to make this work better and more closely match what you really do. Mm -hmm. not we're imposing this new philosophical structure in order to you know make it easier to roll out an android app in a year you know you know i don't think anybody really gets excited about that kind of thing mm -hmm. um but approaching it as you know the degree of flexibility that you want and the the need for reuse or you know multi-channel delivery that you have means that 
you've worked yourself into this language-like problem of these different assemblable modules and stuff like that. And in order to make this work for you, we want to put a little more rigor around how we think about this stuff so that everybody's on the same page. When the design team wants to iterate on how their components look, they're not constantly running into deep disconnects with what people have put into them because there wasn't any really meaningful connection between how it looks and what goes in there. Um, on the engineering side, you know, it's like, hey, we would love it if you didn't have curveballs thrown at you in terms of what people need, you know, new random stuff people need to do with these pieces. We would love it to if there were meaningful rules around what different kinds of pieces are meant to do and how they function with each other that you could use as a baseline for like, oh, new functionality needs to be added. That sounds like a social proof component, not just we need to go to the whiteboard and figure out what something is from square one or each time you have a you have a basic yeah. operating language to work with exactly. to collaborate with your colleagues. Yeah. Okay. And that that has been pretty effective. You know, there's the devil's always in the details, but um, yeah. that has been very effective. Well, I've got a specific devil to raise, which is <laughs> uh, so we're we're doing this project and we're launching a few of them right now, where we're um, we all want to migrate to the single source of truth, put everything in a you know this this common language, etc. First of all, I spent the first half of my career kind of thumping my chest about that goal. Um, uh, you know, and then across the last 10 years have become more and more cognizant of if, if we're going to try to do omni-channel, that's going to involve multiple sources. Like there's going to be, and I've reflected on this with many of my uh, people like, like yourselves, like my peers in the industry, we've been talking about these concepts of single sourcing and single source of truth and uh, unified formats and one language, um, et cetera. Nobody's done it. Like nobody's done all the things. There's no enterprise who has all their stuff in a common format and using one repository. Like, and would you even want to? Is there any repository that does all the things? You know, there's there's PIM systems and CRMs and headless mm -hmm. CMSs for a reason because they're they're very different. They're kind specialized of and, and they're specialized. There's different needs for each of those different kinds of things. You know, like but, you said, a, a product information management has a meaningful overlap with content management, especially when you're talking about marketing and support content and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, but they're very different things, very different workflows and data life cycles and stuff like that. And so, and then there's a the big one between, for example, CRM, because people, a lot of people are using their CRM as a kind mm -hmm. of a knowledge base, but a knowledge base is structured content. And so, then the CRM morphs into your CMS for the marketing site, and no one realized it until two site. years in. Yes. Yes. So this this is um, so uh, it's a now a many to many relationship where we're using kind of uh, this common language more deeply, possibly in like a headless CMS, but then more generally for other systems. Because if we do bring in stuff from other systems. If they have pricing information, or if they have knowledge articles, etc. Um, as just to re uh, reel off a couple of examples that we just brought up, the they've got presentations. They've got a presentation library in SharePoint. Um, you've got to have enough uh, of the high level common language that those can fit together and be mm -hmm. delivered out in a, in a unified experience for audiences. Um, so there's there's that. This is many to many thing and. Even just with your headless CMS, if you've got this new language you defined, aka your content model, I, I would actually I would actually even go farther and say that this kind of language is like more of like a an institution <laughs> an institutional ontology or like a shared language for like messaging that the content model is a part of and connects with, but it's not necessarily one and the same. Especially yes. when you were talking about like, you know, and the design system uses it in this, it's, um, but yeah, th they are very closely connected. I think it might even be no, closer you're to the right. domain model, the way, um, you know, Carrie Hain and Mike Atherton have written about it. Um, yep. It might be closer to that than, um, than just the content model. And it is inspired by the concept of like, 
Um, so their concept of domain model comes from the world of domain driven design. Mm -hmm. And that's the practice. That's like the school of software architecture where the idea of building um, what what it refers to as a ubiquitous language mm -hmm. um, for your software um, is important. And that's like, it's a, it's the intent is to make a language that subject matter experts are, would be capable of describing functionality and not just software engineers. And it should actually really be meaningful and the software should reflect it. Um, and like that idea, um, I think it has been a big inspiration. Absolutely. You know, I mean, that's, that's, all, that's definitely domain driven design has been a big thing for me as well. Um, but uh, so it's, it's that that very high level language of what are the things we're talking about? and How do they relate to each other? And you're right, there's also like taxonomy, like, what are what are our list of products? Like, I've, I've been into many, many organizations that don't even have a definition of what a product is. You know, they have, <laughs> like, is I a mean, product a thing we sell? Or is it still at, a product? At a it, certain, it at a certain level, every organization is ultimately faced with what's the difference between a service and a product <laughs> yeah exactly or um if this is a third party thing re we resell is it a product if this thing is only sellable in conjunction with this other thing is it an add-on or is it a product like defining these things and defining them universally is very very valuable and powerful but so even if in, if you got into a more idealized scenario you're still not all in one kind of system but I want to come back to this kind of the, the content uh, yeah, yeah. aspect that we're working on. On um, let's say you have all that other stuff worked out, you've got all this unstructured content, or or um, or differently structured, or somewhat differently structured, st <laughs> and then you yeah, somewhat structured content, and then you have this new headless CMS which you you want to move on to, and then you're moving everything to that. So mm -hmm. this is a con this I've seen this tackled many, many times in my career. But oh, I'm, yeah. I'm always interested in coming back to it. And I would like to raise it on the podcast because I think that a lot of people don't think about it enough. And, and what's happening now is I'm seeing the headless CMS vendors go full bore into this, you know, put all your content in me and everything will be great. But the getting the content in me and getting the content uh, into structure from unstructured question is something that I, I I'm always looking for a fresh perspective <laughs> um a whole lot of disposable one-time migration code that somebody has to write and yeah it, it, you know it, at the end of the day I don't think anyone anywhere has ever been able to write a magical you know you click the button and boom your stuff migrates um it, mm -hmm. it's just it's one of those things where just the nature of the beast is that there are so many differences in the from and the to from project to project that it's where custom work has to be done. Um, I think from a, you know, and from a developer perspective, data and content migrations are just the bane of every project. And at Lullabot, you know, like many, many years ago, even, you know, it was the running joke was the first meeting with a client when they were thinking about maybe doing a project and they were talking with different vendors. My first question was always, so have you started the migration yet? <laughs> it was like, well, we're not even really sure what the CMS is. It's like, ah, oh, you should have started the migration already. <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. it's because it's also one of the places where I think it's so easy for dragons to be buried in that you know yes. for, for you to un unearth stuff that throws a nasty curveball at your well-laid plans and you know explodes the scope of some of the development work or complicates what was otherwise a fairly polished tight content model and there's edge cases you have to account for that you know no one even remembered but gets unearthed when you know the rubber meets the road of moving stuff from cms a to cms b or whatever um i think that's just I don't think that will ever go away because solving it means solving the problem of content. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's the. Uh, so I think that's. I mean, I, I think there's message I wanted you to convey, yeah. which is that do not yeah. do not underestimate this part mm -hmm. uh, as a very significant uh, portion, um, yeah. and having your new system up and running and being able to to add content to it and deliver content to it doesn't mean that your content 
you know, that you're at all done. The migration is a massive part of these projects. And, and, I, and ideally, I'm, I'm not hearing about it enough work. right now. Yeah, it, it, well, this has actually been something like over the past maybe half a year to a year, um, Autogram has, you know, started focusing more on, not because it's necessarily a shift for us, but because we really started realizing how it, it's, the, it's the moment where a lot of organizations that may not explicitly think about developing a consistent organization-wide, you know, meta model or something like that, mm -hmm. well, migrating content is where they actually encounter the problem and feel the pain and mm -hmm. say, oh my gosh, this is a huge pain and this is where we keep unearthing yeah. undiscovered problems. So it's a great um, told you so moment. Or, or even a, hey, you may not conceptualize this as an organizational ontology problem or a content architecture problem. Your developers may have just warned you that it's just what you got a plan for or something like that. But, you know, that spot, this is where we can help. This is one of the things that, you know, this is one of the key applications of it. Um, and that's actually been like, it, it resonates deeply with, um, with a lot of orgs because, everybody's been through painful migrations and everybody's got horror stories. It's one of those things like, you know, their yeah. first, you know, the, like your driver's ed, you know, experiences or something like that, that people just say, Oh, I remember that. That was horrible. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I do think is interesting, and you touched on this earlier, you mentioned this idea that things live in lots of different systems. And like even going to a headless CMS, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to be consolidated into just that CMS. Yeah. Um, you know, ideally, the benefit of a headless content management system is that it can coexist effectively inside of an ecosystem of lots of different parts, because it doesn't mm -hmm. assume it's in control of everything. Um, it, it's fascinating to me because there's actually a sort of a, a new emergent ecosystem of products whose sole purpose is like orchestration of all of mm -hmm. those different pieces. Um, I think uniform, um, um, is one of them that, you know, we've, you know, taken a look at and been chatting with the folks there. Um, the idea Con is, Concia okay, is another, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they have uh, had people speaking at Omni Channel X before. Mm -hmm. um, so and this idea of the of the orchestration octopus, as I call it, which <laughs> yes. is that you have this many to many things. You have many heads and you have many back ends, and you you it's the routing of all this stuff, which leads mm -hmm. me to uh, leads me to our um, so first of all, yes, I think that's another category of thing which is not being discussed enough. We're talking a lot about putting these these back end CMSs in these headless CMSs in putting the heads on them, but it's the routing of, of who got, now we have all this personalization ability now, how are we gonna make things sure that things go where they go? And, and it takes us to where the role of data is in all this. Mm -hmm. um, and the obligatory AI question of, mm -hmm. can't my AI just handle that for me now? Um, can't it structure my content for me? Can't it like move it, stuff around for me? It'll certainly tell you it can. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh yeah i i mean with a smile yes yeah i i mean that, that's a broad question i like so i'll i'll do my obligatory you know definite defining some terms real quick and say mm -hmm. that i think ai and machine learning and automation tooling like as a category of stuff can definitely be tremendously valuable mm -hmm. um but more recently when people say can ai do this what they usually mean is can generative like large language model based tools like chat gpt or dolly or mm -hmm. mid journey or you know something custom based on, you know, Facebook's, you know, LLM engine, you know, something like that. Can these large language models that seem to be capable of magic? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's responding to human, you know, just responding to natural language instructions with natural language output or even image output or anything that we can, you know, anything that we can translate into some form, you know, it seems like they can. Um, can it do this stuff for me? And I would, I would, I, 
generally urge a great deal of caution when people are asking if a model like that can structure things for me or if it can make sense of things for me because by definition um large language models and these generative ai tools are not making sense of things they are making patterns of things which is sometimes the same but we don't really have control over what kinds of patterns it's recognizing. It may mm -hmm. be, it, it, you know, essentially it's saying, if someone were to say what I just said, what would probably follow it? Mm, oh, like yes. If, you know, it, it's, you know, and sure. it, it makes sense because we're used to conversing like that. But from a meaning standpoint, like, is this the right structure for what we're trying to accomplish? you're not getting analysis of that question. You're getting output that would usually follow someone saying something like this. So, you know, it's, it's one of those places where the natural language aspect of it can be incredibly compelling because mm -hmm. you ask it like, Hey, write me a, write me a poem about peanut butter or write me a product description for a new car or what kinds of um, questions should I ask a movie director about their new film? And it can generate those things because those are kinds of patterns that occur a lot in the kinds of conversations that we have on the internet and in training data and stuff like that. Um, but once we start moving to things like understanding of structures and planning of structures and analysis, it's important to recognize that those models aren't making that jump necessarily. They're still talking about what words usually follow what words, not what concepts are people trying to iron out. So it's very easy to get stuff that is understandable and reads well out of it, but it hasn't necessarily done any of the thinking or the analysis to do things like say, okay, we've got four CMSs and we're going to be doing this with this one and this with that one. And we need to be able to make sure that these two pieces work together effectively. So there's, there's a difference between the AI um, designing my model for me. Yes. And the AI kind of recognizing this looks like it probably goes here in the model. Yes. Uh, which is probably yeah. This a, a looks like job. X. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's where we start getting into areas where um, those kinds of tools can be very effective. When mm -hmm. you have a meaningful like structure and understanding of what's going on and what needs to be there. Um, and the AI is trained well enough to follow the patterns that you have developed and to mm -hmm. work with them yeah. rather than just to come up with its own thing. Um, and that kind of stuff can be very effective. Um, even outside of the realm of large language models, there's lots of interesting tools Absolutely. that can leverage that stuff yeah, yeah. Um, in very useful ways. This is actually one of the reasons why that like developing your organizational language and figuring out what the grammar of your communication with your clients and stuff like that looks like, um, it that can be tremendously effective for building the foundation that you will need to be able to leverage these kinds of, you know, automation and intelligence tools, because you are essentially doing the really hard part for it when you think through that stuff. Um, GPT is really a it's done, I call it the Apple effect, um, <laughs> which is that uh, by getting so much excitement about their product, they're kind of dumbing down the whole market um, in the sense that the, the whole discussion about AI becomes, as you said, about that right. type of AI. When something like um, auto tagging or auto categorization or natural mm -hmm. language processing, which is older and more proven and potentially quite more useful, people are kind of gravitating towards these new tools. Um, the reason I call it the Apple effect is that um, I, I remember when, or I, it's still happening, when, when Metaverse has kind of been a little bit sidetracked right now by AI. But when we we're talking about Metaverse products or, or any kind of um, augmented reality products, there was this, this kind of 
I literally saw reviews of people who were who got these beta testing kits and going, you know, well, it isn't as simple as my iPhone. <laughs> and I went, and I was just going, mm, when did that happen? When did early adopter tech get compared to household commodities? Um, <laughs> you know, and it, it just it actually for me it inhibits the growth of the tech because everything has got to be like iPhone easy it, or, or so there's no time for things to develop. Like the first, I, the first try is never going to be so refined. I, I, I am a compulsive um, hoarder of information. You know, I've got like a, I've got, I think a 28 terabyte uh, network uh, storage system in my house that I just use as my black hole for stuff that I come across. That's interesting, which turns into my own knowledge management challenge, Problem, yeah. which is a subject for probably a whole different podcast for a whole different audience. But um, Jeff organizes hard drive <laughs> poorly. But um, one of the things that I tend to do is whenever there's interesting tech stuff on the research side on the this isn't a product yet, but someone just did something very interesting. Mm -hmm. I tend to grab all the information I can about it and dump it into a folder and say that'll be interesting later. I um, love that. That's I yeah, found that's a really good habit. I, I'm gonna try to do that. I found um, video clips from around 2005, 2006. Uh, yeah, 2005 or so. Um, this was, you know, again, before the iPhone came out. Um, and not not too long, but you know, mm -hmm. before before it was broadly you know broadly accepted as the way you're supposed to do consumer technology stuff, um, and it was basically uh, university students who'd put together a multi-touch interface for manipulating you know objects and information on a computer screen um not just doing i mean i i grew up when touch screens were something that were for museum kiosks you know you, mm -hmm. you had these big chonky buttons that you could press and they would initiate an action but like the the understanding was they weren't great for doing anything complicated yeah atm and, machines <clears throat> yeah exactly and you know there were lots of oh, so different... that's that's bank machines for our Euro european friends ah yes yeah um and there were lots of iterative improvements that needed to happen to make that better you know resolution using capacitive touch rather than actually detecting pressure you know forcing down on the screen but also and i think this is underestimated the concept of multi input touch where you know two fingers means you can rotate things and Inching three fingers zoom. means you can yeah exactly um that as a mo a, a mode of interaction um i think is just as revolutionary as like the mouse as a mode of interaction instead of mm -hmm. arrow keys um and you know the iphone in a lot of ways was built on the backs of lots of different parallel improvements and it's very difficult for technologies that are where all of those pieces haven't yet come together, mm -hmm. but the work is still continuing when they're judged by the standards of a product space where the critical mass of different pieces have come together and a company like Apple has come in and produced a highly polished result on top of that sort of yeah, union exactly. of features. And we don't know what that that magical critical mass of improvements is until it happens and everybody goes, ah, of course. That's and, and what we Coming back to AI. Yes. That definitely hasn't happened with ChatGPT yet. Mm -hmm. it, I think for, that, for certain kinds of tasks, I think it has. Like ideative stuff. Like um, I think Brian Eno, the musician, um, did uh, a, like back in the seventies, released a, a product called um, the uh, um, Oblique Strategies, and it was basically just a deck of cards with phrases on it, like try subtracting something, or um, you know, like d different things that were just very general, but meaningful in a lot of creative and ideative contexts and the idea was 
if you're blocked, you just pull out this deck and you say, okay, what's, what's in my oblique strategies deck? You know, it's like, okay, let's just try subtracting some elements of this thing that we're working on and what changes, what, what, how does that alter things? It doesn't necessarily solve your problem, but it can help you get rolling and get out of that locked state where mm -hmm. you're sort of so sunk in the details of everything that's happened. And I so think the, that the role of the dice aspect or not, not role of the dice aspect, but the it, it's more directed than pure randomness but yeah, like it has that outsider yeah thing. outside that's so it's the it's a fully unlimited thinking um yeah. it's, it's it only limited by kind of language and a general attachment to statistics but yes. other than that it can come up with stuff mm -hmm. which will come out of left field for you and it's it's hard it's and almost anything you ask it to it often comes up with a, a couple extra ideas which is huge yes and that i think is one of the places where it really excels just because of that aspect of it like you know it, that I, and i don't think that's anything inherently magical about large language models it's like mm -hmm. you know a 72 card deck by brian eno from the 70s you know was able to accomplish aspects of that mm -hmm. and i think that's the role that a lot of people are finding tremendously valuable for llms now mm -hmm. it can go through and you know fill out the details of you know some of those speculative you know suggestions in a way that a deck of cards obviously can't but i think that's one of the places that people really feel like it's a fundamentally creative tool um where it can help them with that kind of stuff and i think that's yeah. that's very interesting and that's an aspect of it that i don't think a lot of other tools like machine language categorization stuff like that that we've worked with in our space previously i don't think they've really brought that to it and i think that's yeah. interesting it's very interesting and so um when i say it hasn't iphone what the i what i talk about the iphone it's it it is it is a platform product it's a product mm -hmm. on which other experiences can be built and other uh things can be connected um whereas for example, ChatGPT is, it's got certain things it's quite good at, a lot of things it's not very good at, and a lot of things it sort of gives the impression it could be good at, but it, it doesn't. So we come That's back to- That's the problem of it being very good with language. Yes. It can bluff very well. Very well. It so doesn't the, even know that it's bluffing. It's just exactly. saying stuff. So the example, I, I think I was saw on a TED talk recently was, um, uh, I think this is a helpful example for helping people understand what it is and is not actually doing when mm -hmm. it seems like it understands what you are saying. Um, it, well, two uh, one is the, 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 the bicycle example is if you ask chat GPT, I don't know if it, they fix this, but if you chat uh, until very recently, if you ask chat GPT, if you rode a bicycle over a bridge and under the bridge was lots of broken glass and nails, what would happen to the wheels of your bicycle? And it would say, you know, your bicycle tires would probably pop because it, it, it doesn't actually it's not, understand. It's not this. making a model of the problem. It isn't like there is no internal mental model of the concepts you're making. What it's doing is saying, oh, when have people said things like this? What usually yeah. follows this? And usually that's not the kind of word problem that someone poses and also inserts a caveat that essentially renders it moot yeah, yeah. so the, it can't it, the, the idea of riding a bike over a bridge and riding a bike over broken glass and nails it can't it doesn't actually understand right that and idea. that's and that's inherent in the nature of how a large language model works it understands semantic connections like it, it, it can do things like um I mean, and, and this is where I think it grabs people with like this almost magical quality because of the way that language works and how words get used in connection to each other mm -hmm. as like at a nitty gritty detail level, you can do things like say, okay, I want the word king, subtract king? the king, like, you know, king, a monarch yeah. or whatever, yeah, yeah. subtract the word man from king and you get the word queen huh or add the word woman to king and you get queen or add son and you get prince 
that feels genuinely magical mm-hmm. from uh, you know from someone who's looking at it and it implies a kind of understanding that it looks used, like understanding we're used to mapping that to intelligence and yeah. it's really spectacular and i'm not minimizing it like that is a legitimate advancement of the field however it does not understand the difference between a constitutional monarchy and a direct democracy <laughs> like those broader conceptual models yes are what it's making it's detecting connections in words and sometimes phrases and how they get used with each other and how one word is often not present when another one is it's able to take huge bodies of statistical data about how people talk and use language and Mm -hmm. come up with really fascinating stuff like that and really amazing stuff like that but it is not building what we would think of as a mental model for Mm -hmm. X based on those kinds of prompts. And I think that's the most important thing for people to remember when they're talking about using it to solve problems and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's very easy to get sucked into that. So the, my other example is, is I think, uh, goes in a different direction away from language and, and concepts and, uh, is the example like chat gpt can't do math if you <laughs> or, or it can it, if the question is common enough oh like, yeah yeah if you yeah. ask two plus two sure um if you because if it's looked at times tables enough it can do that but like all the math isn't out on the internet because that would be all of the atoms in the universe yeah so if you ask it to do questions that it hasn't seen before or uh, when you ask it to do for example write uh write a paragraph of a certain length um, you can't do it. J- uh, Jordan Peterson, um, you know, Canada's most infamous man, uh, uh, <laughs> Jordan Peterson, the, um, I'm not gonna even go into that. You can Google him yourself. Uh, but he asked it for, for example, um, say, not, I think it was tantamount to say nice things about, uh, Donald Trump and say nice things about, um, Joe Biden and the, the <laughs> length, the, um, answers were different lengths. Um, the Joe Biden one was longer, which he took as a sign of left-wing bias. And then he says, do it again, but make them the same length. And it couldn't because it, like, it can't. It just doesn't, it, it's not right. Counted. It's it like, can't do that. It hasn't even understood the question. I, I did the same thing about apples. Yeah. Like you, you don't, you know, it's like its inability to follow precise instructions for generating variations isn't a sign of mapped bias. <laughs> it's a sign that like you are bumping up into the edges of what it is conceptually built to be able to do yeah it's you i think i think that freaks people out as a computer that can't count most <laughs> people like, of all of the things that we've always said computers could do counting is one of them <laughs> yes there there's always like it's always just a, a shiny calculator with bells and whistles and this is a computer that this is an example that it can't calculate because it's a language model it doesn't have a mathematical model. Right. It doesn't know how and, to access a calculator. And that's actually like some of the really advanced um, applications of some of these large language models. The way they work is actually adding essentially recognizers on top of it to say, okay, once you've done your large language model work and broken things down into you know these different kinds of you know symbols and tokens and stuff like that, I'm going to put together some tools for recognizing when certain kinds of well understood problems are present in this natural language thing, like math or something like that, or mm-hmm. chemistry questions. And what I've done is I'm not bothering with all this linguistic stuff, but I've got a very solid mathematical, you know, equation parsing engine that can do math problems. So I will take over for this little chunk of you know, the response where I can see that a math question is happening. Um, And this is a great example of how there are actually lots of different approaches to AI and machine learning. Um, Wolfram research um, that I think, you know, people have seen Wolfram Alpha Mm -hmm. um, is one of the services out there. And it can answer questions like, um, you know, what are your odds of dying in a penguin attack in, you know, Antarctica? And 
it and it actually you know shows its work in terms of okay here's statistics i found here's research i found that matches these things i have a model of how to convert between different types of measurements i know about statistics not because i've read all of the internet but because i was built with a model of statistical analysis mm -hmm. and it can do things like say well I don't think there's actually enough information to answer that question. I can't fill in the gaps in what I would say is necessary to calculate that. Or if you ask a different question, it may say, oh, yeah, OK, I can put together a rough estimate of X. It can't write a poem about that. It can't wax poetic about it for two paragraphs. Or right in the style designed, of William Shakespeare. Exactly. But it's designed to be able to reason through, you know, it's designed to be able to walk through those structured, meaningful problems. And there is now a chat GPT plugin that allows Wolfram Alpha to intercept certain kinds of sub elements of those things and like do spot answers inside of a larger language tool. And a lot of the really interesting stuff, that's the shape it takes of mapping specialized models and specialized rule systems when the problems can be recognized. But then those things, that's what everybody's, that's what people have been doing for years of, you know, building meaningful human understood rules for reasoning through certain kinds of known problems. So let's tie these two threads together. So if can we come back to our can't I, I do this for me thing <laughs> from before? Mm -hmm. Can we say that if your if your content set is big enough and your project is big enough, then actually training an AI and, and uh, setting up some of these recognizers might be worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that that's that's definitely I, the case. Plus I, there are off the shelf um they need tuning also like any like a search engine um but uh, categorizers and taggers yes who can yeah. do a good job for you as well so that what's been around for five years in the world of pool party and and uh such tools mm -hmm. um plus what we now have with chat gpt and and the ability to extend it through through custom code we're getting to a point where we could get closer and we could do a lot of pre-work um yeah. but you're your migration from unstructured content to structured <laughs> content and your headless CMS loading is not going to be trivial. Like these are, yeah. these are large projects and there there's, uh, I, I wish, I don't know if you're going to hesitate to pull a statistic, um, from your nether regions, but I'm, I'm happy to, to make out, one up. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, the, the, how much, like percentage wise, what is the ratio between the effort of setting up and, and, and modeling your CMS versus actually migrating your, your old content into it, which is not, not, not obviously all the time because everyone's going to have a different amount of legacy content and their, their target models will be more, more or less complicated. But, you know, could you, could you hazard a, a ratio as a, as a rough rule of thumb? Well, so in the classic consultant, mode i'm actually going to hedge and say it depends um <laughs> i would say that you have to decide where the line between migration and modeling is going to be drawn to even do that kind of a number because and i, I have talked about this before i think i even talked about it at an omni channel exit event um, where i did a talk on it but um modeling isn't just the process of describing like the ideal platonic form of your content concepts that's an aspect of it and that's an element of it but that's the kind of stuff that also like never quite survives contact with all of the real content and mm -hmm. that's where migration throws curveballs in it's mm -hmm. you know it is the history of all of the real stuff that you've actually produced over time. And in that sense, the reason that starting migration early and treating it um, as a meaningful part of discovery work and scoping work, not just a task that needs to be done, the reason it's important is because 
all of those curveballs and all of those edge cases are contained in it. It is what you have actually done in the past. And it informs the modeling work mm -hmm. in help in letting you know what edge cases you need to account for or where you model as it stands in the platonic form is insufficient to effectively represent the full breadth of what you're going to be doing with it. Mm -hmm. It informs that modeling effort. So I would say that if you don't, if you treat migration as an informative part of that and part of that investigation, um, I'd go so far as saying like 50, 50, maybe, maybe more. Um, that's what I, that's the number I was going to pull out of mind that yeah. as well. Like, but like, but if you treat the migration as like the mechanical process of writing the code that moves things from point to point and translates HTML to, you know, to rich text or whatever stuff needs to happen, I'd say that number goes down considerably um, just because that's complex and difficult development work. But mm -hmm. it's very rare that like you run into if you actually understand all the stuff that's there, you're not having curveballs thrown at you where you say, oh, okay, we got to go find out a new way to do this or, oh, we're putting it in the wrong yeah. shape. And we that's the same this. distinction between when you're talking about any complex solution development, <laughs> mm -hmm. how much of it is understanding the problem and how much of it is built. Like yeah. if, you've, if you've properly understood the problem, and if it's a difficult problem, that will take you much more work than actually when you get to the point of going, okay, now we've solved the pro problem. In theory, we just need coders to code the thing so it and, doesn't. And, and sometimes, you know, it also means saying, okay, and here's the criteria by which we're going to just treat stuff as a legit special case and say our, mm -hmm. our really carefully modeled system will not directly account for this. We've just got like our sin eater content type whose job is to hold all the ugly stuff and, you know, we'll, you know, figuring out how far do you, do you have to go with yeah. the rigidly modeled stuff? Before you just say, well, that's an exception. I was and, just going to say that uh, you, you, if you, it sounds like you take a slightly different approach because my, my, or maybe you don't. What we do often is that we have our new shiny model, which is as we want it. Mm -hmm. And then we have our, I, I love the term sin eater. We have our, we have <laughs> our kind of our blob type. This is like the <laughs> stuff goes here. The type. generic page. Exactly. So, uh, but, and if we, if we got to get a move on, and the management says you need you need to launch by this date and have the stuff in by this date. And we're like, all right, these two <laughs> objectives are are at odds. So we're gonna have to have like we're gonna we are gonna have to do a dump so that we can decommission the old system, drop it all in there, but then it doesn't go in our shiny new model. Um, mm -hmm. And I was kind of getting from what you were saying that you you're mm, sometimes in the new model you're making more allowances to get some of that stuff over faster, which it's, you know, could be, we, we've we actually had three stages before where we had totally just dumped in kind of better and then the shiny new model. And we actually kept track of them in the CMS to make sure that they weren't mixed. Is, it, it, is that and about, you're taking similar yeah, stuff? Yeah, that, that, that's very similar. Um, yeah. I think one of the challenges is like, anytime you have those sort of pressure release valves. Yeah, um, not abusing them. It, it, yeah, it requires ongoing monitoring to mm -hmm. make sure that they don't, you know, while you're not looking, they turn into 30% of the website is your special case rando blob content type that anything yeah. can be dumped into. I mean, ironically, like that's where the current generation of page building tools, you know, of like, oh, I just throw some blocks together and make a special page. 90% of them started as that, oh, we just need something to do some of these real special weird pages. And two years later, the company's like, huh, 75% of our website is page pages that <laughs> do exactly what everybody wants, but we have no idea what they are. It's like, you, yeah. you have to keep an eye on that and recognize, like, if those weird, uncategorizable edge cases are really growing to become that much of your model, it's a sign that your model is insufficient for the use cases that are actually being played out, 
or the education and the you know organization yeah. hasn't you know the govern there's a governance problem because people either aren't aware of or aren't being given the tools to effectively use the new model or whatever um you know there, there's a bunch of different you know or, or there are legitimate new patterns of usage emerging mm -hmm. that you are going to need to expand the model to uh, you know to accommodate um, so in that sense, it can be useful to have those pressure release valves, but you have to treat it as part of an ongoing an ev evolution of your model, not just where the bad stuff goes. <laughs> so we've done some things, some things as simple as it's in there, uh, the developers can pull it out so that it displays on whatever the channel needs to be, but no one can say file new page page. <laughs> if you say if you create a new x it's got to be of a type from the model um mm -hmm. you can't go in and you can't create new content in this blob kind of squishy form yeah yeah okay so we are way over We're way over Wait, this is I how it just, goes. it's a double episode it's two and one um <laughs> uh, ai and migration and back again um so this has been awesome uh so Jeff, I, I, I we got to wrap it up there. I love talking to you. I think I could talk to you indefinitely. Always a pleasure. Always great. Um, I see. I've been on your podcast like what two or three times, and I think this is the first time yeah. you've done webinars with us and 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 panels. Yeah, I, I think the think first this time you've been be... on the podcast. Yeah. All right. Well, we gotta we gotta do it again sometime. Absolutely. All right, awesome. So thank you so much, and uh, thank you all for joining. So remember, this is part of our designing content for headless. Omnichannel and personalization session series on omnichannelx.digital. You can check that out um, wherever our event lists are, are showing up. And uh, this will be on the on demand section. You can get it and uh, also check out all the panel discussions that Jeff was part of with Carrie Hain, myself, Megan Casey, Chris Saunders, um, and uh, other great podcast episodes and, uh, and stuff there. It's a cornucopia of content <laughs> modeling uh, and content design goodness. So again, thank you very much, Jeff. And we'll see you on, uh, we've got a webinar, uh, depending on when you're hearing this, we're going to be recording the next panel discussion in, uh, in a few weeks. I'm looking forward to it. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening. This has been the Omni Channel Podcast with Naz Rubina, founder of Rubina Consulting. Let us know on LinkedIn or Twitter uh, what you liked from this episode, what you think we missed, uh, who do you think we should interview next. And now that you've heard what we're passionate about, all you can also check out urbinaconsulting.com to learn a little bit about what we do.